afternoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm Gleaves Whitney, director of the Hallenstein Center here at Grand Valley State University. And on behalf of the Hallenstein Center, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's always great to see the uh, people who have followed the career of the Hallenstein Center. Of course, our founding benefactor, Ralph Hallenstein, here at the head table. Uh, Fred and Lena Meyer here. His daughter, uh, Haley, is here. Haley Meyer. We're so glad all of you are here. Thank you very much. I'd also, of course, particularly like to thank Hank Meyer for giving the capstone talk in what was an extremely successful lecture series on Alexander Hamilton that we inaugurated this summer. Most of the talks have been standing room only, and I see we're not going to be disappointed today because of our distinguished speaker. As you know, Hank is a passionate biographer of Arthur Vandenberg. He's writing the definitive biography of Vandenberg, of uh, Michigan's most famous senator. And he'll be speaking about Vandenberg's surprisingly passionate studies of Alexander Hamilton. Now, here at the center, we always welcome to talk about Vandenberg since he and Ralph Hallenstein were editors at the Grand Rapids Herald. We also welcome to talk about Hamilton since he and Ralph were childhood friends. <laughs> <laughs> Now the date we chose to hold this event is hardly random, as our kids would say. Uh, it was two years ago today that the official portrait of Senator Vandenberg was unveiled on Capitol Hill. You can see it today in the Senate reception room there on the south wall, right next to a painting featuring, now this is really, this is absolutely true, Ripley's Believe It or Not material, a painting featuring Alexander Hamilton. And if you look at all the other paintings of people in the Senate reception room, the figure who is closest to Vandenberg is Hamilton. So that's quite a coincidence. But it's no coincidence that the best interpreter in Vandenberg and his studies of Hamilton is with us today. Hank Meyer is himself a veritable painter in words. And while he needs no introduction to this distinguished audience, I note that Hank has let me read part of his biography of Vandenberg, and it is engaging, it is perceptive, it is well written. I think it will make a permanent contribution. It certainly is three dimensional as the statue over here on uh, Monroe Street, and it has all the immediacy of that statue. Well, I cannot think of anyone or any place more appropriate to teach us about West Michigan's fascinating connection between uh, Arthur Vandenberg and Alexander Hamilton. Ladies and gentlemen, Hank Meyer. Thank you, Gleaves. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to, to be with you today. And um, I've tried to, uh, Alexander Hamilton and Arthur Vandenberg, among the many things they had in common was to preach the need for preparedness, for the country to be prepared for its economic growth, for its uh, military security. Um, Gleaves said, well, this is just going to be a simple little brown bag luncheon. Why don't you come on in and chat? And so when I discovered what an august group this was going to be, I tried to make up for my lack of preparedness with a lot of props. And so that's what you, you see here. Um, Alex, Arthur Vandenberg was born 80 years after that uh, duel at Weehawken where Aaron Burr killed Alexander Hamilton. Um, and as a boy growing up in Grand Rapids, uh, Hamilton quickly became his hero, and he was, Vandenberg was a great hero worshiper, and uh, I was trying to think, you know, how did that come to pass? Certainly, Hamilton, to the extent that he could be seen as the father of the Republican Party, was a, a natural for uh, Vandenberg to admire, but I think it goes well beyond that, and so even this is a, even though this is kind of a story of ideas and um, thoughts articulated in the 1920s when Vandenberg was editor of the Grand Rapids Herald and before he went to the Senate. It starts a little sooner than that. And I digress by saying I was hearing a um, psychologist talk on, on the radio the other day about how it is that people come to, to um, a lot of their, when, when a lot of their lifelong passions take hold. And even like things like classic rock with baby boomers and how certain songs uh, resonate with us throughout our lives. And the psychologist was saying that 
what you're doing what you experience when you're 20 is what stays with you longest in your life, I mean, generally speaking. And so Arthur Vandenberg, who was born in 1884, uh, what were his experiences in his youth that might have stayed with him and drawn him to Alexander Hamilton? And one of the things I think was that in 1902, there was published a, bio, a fictionalized biography of Hamilton. It was called The Conqueror, and the author was a woman named Gertrude Atherton. And it was, for its day, it was a great historical biography. It was one of the first really big, best-selling historical biographies, and it talked about Hamilton. So imagine Vandenberg as an 18, 19-year-old reading this biography, which he long said was his favorite book, and having Alexander Hamilton described to him. And then we, uh, 1903, Gertrude Atherton published the selected letters of Alexander Hamilton. And so these were popular favorites coming into a home in Grand Rapids talking about Hamilton, really bringing him back to life because he had become a relatively forgotten founding father since he never became president, unlike the, um, so many of his contemporaries and since his, his reputation had been eclipsed by uh, Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and Adams as well as, as George Washington. So here he is in Vandenberg's youth, we're seeing the first revival of Hamilton's memory. And as Vandenberg would have read that story, he would have, he didn't strain a little bit, but he would have found some similarities in their lives. Um, Hamilton, and I have to back up and say that I am not a Hamilton scholar. Anybody in this room who has attended Gleave's lecture or any of the others probably knows more about Alexander Hamilton than I do. So this is, there's a little presumption in, in talking about this. But Hamilton, of course, was um, very famously said to be an illegitimate son on the island of Nevis in the Caribbean. Uh, went to work at a very young age as a, as a clerk for a merchant there and really was on his own in many respects from a, from a very young age. Well, Alec, uh, Arthur Vandenberg, growing up in Grand Rapids, uh, his father Aaron had been a very prosperous harness maker, but in the Panic of 1893, which even though we don't hear much about it, rivaled the Great Depression, rivaled the crash of 1929 and its economic implications and, and, and the, the devastation it caused for a lot of Americans. Uh, his father's harness making business on South Division was ruined. And Arthur, at nine years old, went to work doing all kinds of odd jobs, starting a little delivery business, um, contributing to the family's welfare, and really feeling like, in many respects, he was on his own economically from then on. Arthur also was very attached to his mother, much in the way that Alexander Hamilton was, and I think uh, saw some similarities there. He also attached himself to older people as mentors and, and became a protege of people in a way that was very similar to what Hamilton did. And I think in, in another way, uh, both Hamilton and Vandenberg, although Vandenberg in a much less distinguished way, were men of words as well as men of action. They both were writers. I mean, Hamilton was a, was a brilliant prose writer uh, in, in the Federalist Papers and elsewhere. Uh, Vandenberg was not, but he fancied himself that. And as editor of the Grand Rapids Herald, had some claim to be, uh, to be a, a stylist of prose. Uh, but neither were satisfied with that. Both of them wanted to affect policy and wanted to be a part of the, the pulse of the nation and went on to do so. Well, I said this is a story of, of the 1920s because Arthur Vandenberg in 1920 was 36 years old, but he'd already been editor of the Grand Rapids Herald for 13 years. Took over that job, actually, a, almost 14 years, took over that job on his 20, near his 22nd birthday. So he too, even though at that point uh, Hamilton was on his way to being a revolutionary war hero, uh, somewhat bigger stage, both were achievers at a very young age. And by 1920, Vandenberg was pretty restless in that job as editor of the Grand Rapids Herald. He might have only been 36 years old, but he'd been doing it forever. 
He had political ambitions which he hadn't figured out how to satisfy because the only job he really wanted was senator. And so somebody would want him to run for Congress, want him to run for lieutenant governor or governor, and he'd be tempted, but he'd pass on it. But he also felt like he was kind of biding his time. He'd tried to write a syndicated column called What Makes a Man, and nobody would picked it up for syndication. He'd written some short stories, a lot of short stories, and some of them had been published in national magazines, but not very many, and um, he wasn't getting very far with, with that literary career. So I think he decided he needed to reach a wider stage. He'd written some speeches for Warren Harding in the 1920 campaign and got a taste of influencing some of the national political debate on the League of Nations and on other subjects. Um, so he was looking for a wider audience, so what to do. So we, in 1920, a magazine uh, published uh, a, a list of first-class men in American history. I say men because this was a, a sexist age when that was the way people were classifying things. And on that list of distinguished Americans was not Alexander Hamilton. Well, Vandenberg was frosted by that, and he took that as a beginning point to, um, to think about how he would elevate Hamilton in the public mind and also sort of identify himself with Hamilton. And this was also the, the, the dawn of the um, Harding Coolidge years of the 20s, and even though Vandenberg was, was a good Republican and had helped write Harding's speeches, he too was disillusioned with the kind of government that was resulting. And um, at the dawn of, of in, in the night, early 20s, he wrote, many of our public troubles, most of them, are traceable to the efforts of second-class men and who are functioning in first-class responsibilities. What was needed, he argued, was first-class men. And how do you find those and develop them and encourage them? And so Vandenberg reached back into American history to do that. And, said, you know, we need to rediscover Alexander Hamilton. So what he did was create this survey where he would solicit the views from prominent people, not only all over the country, but all over the world, to ask them who was the greatest American. And he would redress, as he said, the, and, um, and then he would proceed to make his case for his idea of the greatest American, which was, no surprise, Alexander Hamilton. And so he said he wanted to redress the glaring ingratitude of Americans to honor Alexander Hamilton. Nearly all of us, he wrote, have built a shrine within our hearts and souls to some one favorite above all others, which kind of gives you an insight into how, how seriously he viewed hero worship. So he decides to, to do this survey, and he writes to all these different people and um, got a lot of responses from Franklin Roosevelt, from Winston, who was then a young man and not yet a major political rival of Vandenberg's, Winston Churchill, all kinds of people. Um, everybody except Henry Cabot Lodge, who was Hamilton's biographer and the uh, Senate majority leader, who, who was an academic in his own right, a distinguished biographer, and a bit of a snob, and he wrote back to Vandenberg that he found the exercise simple-minded and he refused to participate. But for those who did, Lincoln was the first choice. He was favored by people from Winston Churchill to the labor leader Samuel Gompers, the journalist William Allen White, John D. Rockefeller, Upton Sinclair, Rabbi, Rabbi Stephen Wise, the naturalist John Burroughs, <laughs> Um, the historian Frederick Jackson Turner praised Frank, Benjamin Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, but he came up with, with Lincoln, too. Um, then the runner-up was Washington, and he got a lot of support. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt picked him, so did the president of Cuba. Uh, a lot of Democrats were, and Southerners were more comfortable picking Washington than Lincoln because they didn't really want to be identified with a Republican. Uh, one university president in the South chose Benjamin Franklin, but he requested anonymity because, because I am aware that this judgment will seem singular to many of my friends from the South. <laughs> but um, former Senator Albert Beveridge, who was a Lincoln biographer, said that history reveals distinct periods when leadership sinks appallingly, while at, others, at other periods, supereminent men appear among us. And I think Vandenberg in the 20s was writing his book at a time when leadership was sinking appallingly. People were disillusioned after World War 
One, when European leaders had led the world into a cataclysmic and, and really uh, tragic war, and when American leaders in the Harding administration were scandal ridden and disgraced. So then, with that backdrop, Hamilton really, or Vandenberg really wrote his book to celebrate the, the super eminent men who had appeared before. And in 1921, appeared this, his first book on Hamilton called The Greatest American. And he cataloged Hamilton's achievements and uh, from his farewell address to, for uh, General George Washington in which uh, he very famously argued against entangling alliances and for the, the importance to the young republic of, of achieving neutrality. Uh, where he argued in, uh, in elsewhere, where he argued in favor of building a strong national economy with um, the financial resources to, to build a manufacturing base and um, all of these issues that, that um, Vandenberg Belt found very relevant to the 20s. A uh, book was published by G.P. Putnam, uh, was reviewed quite widely. Um, the didn't hurt that a lot of the most important people in the country were in that book. Um, in fact, the, the preface was from President Harding with a letter of commendation, although it looked like Vandenberg's words in Harding's mouth. Um, the American Historical Review, though, found it an amateurish survey of Hamilton's life and qualities coached in a language of a conventional eulogy. But Vandenberg was undaunted by that. Um, when, he, when the book was published, he went to New York. He made a, a pilgrimage to Hamilton's tomb at Trinity Church and uh, visited the site of the duel with that statue over at Weehawken. And that, I think that's Vandenberg's own photo. And uh, next to that is uh, Hamilton's birthplace on the island of Nevis. Uh, so he came back from there in the summer of 1922 some of you who are familiar with Holland may recall Lakewood Farm, which was um, on, the, on the north side of Holland, and there was a Chicago coal magnate named George Getz who uh, had, had his own zoo there, and he owned a lot of acreage on the lake and a number of buildings and rented out cottages to a number of, of Republican friends. Senator William Alden Smith spent many summers there. Vandenberg spent a lot of time there in the summer. And it was there that Vandenberg began working seriously on his second book, which he called If Hamilton Were Here Today. And in the first book, he was trying to, um, to develop the case for Hamilton as the greatest American. In the second one, he was trying to apply Hamilton's thoughts to, to the current age. And I think it was a little bit of Vandenberg trying to understand what was going on in the sort of the roar of the 1920s. Uh, he was uncomfortable with the, 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 some of the radicalism of the age, and um, he, he warned of the dangers of, of speakeasy radicalism. This was the time of, of prohibition and, and lawlessness in a lot of ways, and um, the emergence of post-revolution of the, the communist government in Russia. Uh, hu another huge wave of immigration to the U.S. in a very, very unsettled time. And so, once again, he was um, trying to figure out how, Van how Hamilton's ideas would apply. And he argued that Hamilton was the greatest progressive of his own time. Um, in fact, he mentioned that Hamilton was a foe to censorship, including undoubtedly, and this is Vandenberg projecting Hamilton into the 1920s, censorship of the modern motion picture, which is, which is kindred to the press as a mode of expression. And I might add that another of the people who rented cottages from George Getz at Lakewood or visited there frequently um, was the chair of the Republican National Committee a fell, and Harding's campaign manager, a fellow named Will Hayes. And for those of you who recall, the, um, Will Hayes went on to Hollywood and was responsible for the first code and rating system and the twin beds and the bedrooms and all that good stuff. So uh, Vandenberg and he and Vandenberg became good friends. But in the jargon of the jazz age, Vandenberg regarded Aaron Burr as a gangster who used money to control elections, and, um, where, where Hamilton would, would guard the least part, wealthy part of the community from oppression, uh, Burr would, would take a different direction. Um, he said that Hamilton liked taxes on consumption as opposed to direct taxation. 
And he said, surely Hamilton would have rejected, quote, the vaulting nonsense of, a socialistic, and, of, of socialistic and communistic conceits. And of course, no one made the case for neutrality in foreign affairs better than Hamilton. And here, uh, Vandenberg quotes him from the Federalist number 34, where he wrote, a cloud has been for some time hanging over the European world. If it should break forth into storm, who can ensure us that its progress that in its progress, a part of its fury would not be spent upon us. Hamilton's allegiance, Vandenberg said, stopped at the American shoreline, but his vision roamed the world. Now he did say Hamilton was not the astigmatized isolationist who fools himself into thinking that America is wholly immune to the effects of eruption, economic or political, in other continents. And Vandenberg would never, even though he became identified as an isolationist uh, with the advent of World War II and resisted American involvement before Pearl Harbor, he never called himself that. And he liked to think that he was a nationalist in the Hamilton mode, protecting the interests of the United States and not blindly refusing to become involved in, in foreign adventures. Reviews of that second book were pretty mixed too. The American Political Science Review said that what the author has really done in an interesting and ingenious manner is to give us his own views on various issues supported by frequent references to Hamilton's writing and public utterances. The New York Times concluded that allowing for the defect of its style, which may be called flamboyant, from which many adjectives could be cut with advantage. Now, Vandenberg was an editor, but he had nobody to edit him. <laughs> this book will be found to be a stimulant for those who have lost sight of the teachings of Alexander Hamilton. Um, less flattering was the New York Herald Tribune. Mr. Vandenberg's volume is obviously meant to do two things, the reviewer noted, to reemphasize the nation's debt to Hamilton and to justify the author's political creeds. There is too much stretching and straining to do the former and too much prejudice to do the latter. But uh, Vandenberg didn't give up. He was, he worshiped Hamilton. Uh, he had made, he and his wife Hazel made the trip to Nevis to make a pilgrimage to Hamilton's birthplace. Um, he quoted Hamilton frequently, of course, in his speeches, and in 1926 did a third book on Alexander Hamilton, or derived from Hamilton's writings, called The Trail of a Tradition. And he was still, um, he, he was still very conscious of the need to resuscitate uh, Hamilton's memory. And, uh, here again, there's a puffed up vocabulary, but he's trying to trace Hamilton's call for neutrality from the time of the revolution to the then present of the 1920s. And he found that, um, he talked about a path from the founding fathers to America first, a phrase he used, although it was a group that he never actually joined and before it was an organization. And he found that trail, that tradition, a thrilling tale in sturdy achievement, as thrilling a tale in sturdy achievement as ever made legend out of romance. This guy was in love with Alexander Hamilton. Um, and this is in the wake of the time when the most pressing public debate of the age had been over American membership in the League of Nations after World War I. And Vandenberg had tried to find room for a compromise there between Wilson's refusal to change any language in the proposed covenant and Henry Cabot Lodge's suspicion of Wilson and insistence that um, some modification be made. And of course that collapsed and we had to wait until another world war to have the United Nations. But um, Vandenberg was really trying to understand America's role through Hamilton's eyes. And that's, that was the, the tradition he was seeking. Um, I've been, been going on for a bit now and I don't want to go on too long and I'd, I'd love to answer your questions, but then I have to, to say that um, that was in 1926. That was his third book. Um, he had, this, Vandenberg had decided it was time to run for the Senate. If he was ever gonna have an opportunity, it was going to be the um, election of 1928 when the Democratic Senator Woodbridge Ferris, who had become Senator um, back in, or it actually um, become governor, I believe, back during the 
uh, the Michigan always been very Republican state, but then when the, the Bull Moose Party split off in 1912, um, and of course Wilson was elected president when Teddy Roosevelt and uh, challenged William Howard Taft and split the, the Republican vote, um, and Woodbridge Ferris became governor of Michigan, the Democrats cracking the sort of Republican dominance of the state, and then Fer Ferris became senator, and but he was quite elderly in 1928, and there was a question of whether he would run, it would look like he wasn't going to run for re-election. And so Arthur Vandenberg uh, and his allies began to prepare his Senate race in late 1927, early 1928, and starting uh, Vandenberg organizations in counties throughout the state, uh, positioning himself for a race in the Republican primary, thinking it was his turn, and then in the spring of 1928, uh, Woodbridge Ferris died very suddenly. And the uh, then Governor Green of, from Ionia, the governor of Michigan, Republican, had to decide who to appoint in his place. And Vandenberg was the clear front runner for the nomination. He'd set up all the organizations, but then his organization throughout the state was preparing a serious run. But when Ferris died, then a lot of other people said, hey, you know, Governor Green, you know, I've supported you all these years, will you appoint me? There were in fact two former governors who wanted the job if they could be appointed. They hadn't, hadn't planned to run, but hey, if I can get there by appointment. So Vandenberg's uh, uh, appointment was in doubt, but uh, ultimately he was appointed to the Senate in the spring of 1928. And when he went to Washington in April, um, the day before he departed, he drafted a letter placing a fellow named Carl Saunders. And Ralph, I don't know if you remember Carl. He, as his successor as editor of the Grand Rapids Herald, put him in charge of the Herald's editorial page. And Vandenberg wrote to Saunders and he said, I am, for the first time in nearly a quarter century, relinquishing immediate contact, in other words, with, with the Herald but his voice would not be confined entirely to the news pages in the future, because he also wrote, I shall always be in telegraphic reach. And he told Saunders, my own wires to you will be signed Hamilton. Oh. And uh, I'd like to think that even if you look at Vandenberg's signature, and I haven't got a blown up sample of it, but he was Arthur Hendrick Vandenberg. He, signed his name A.H. Vandenberg, and it looked very similar to the A. Hamilton that Hamilton used. Uh, he just about did everything, every, emulated uh, him in every way. In fact, I was, I was talking to one of our uh, fellow Grand Rapids residents who, who grew up, who was a, a child when he lived on Morris Avenue, and. Um, would watch him commute to work every day and said that the, the things that, that this person heard from her parents and from other people was that he'd be walking down the street on his way from Morris Avenue down to the, to the Grand Rapids Herald, which was on Fulton across from Veterans Park, and that um, Vandenberg frequently wouldn't acknowledge the person walking by the other way. Well, talking to Vandenberg's daughter, and, and Vandenberg was, it, uh, it, it, and she said, well, you know, a lot of times what he was doing was um, memorizing things or working on, working over problems in his mind. That's exactly what Hamilton had a reputation for doing on the streets of New York. I mean, neither one was an, an introvert or shy in any way, but that was, I, I think there was some, some conscious emulation there. Um, but anyway, the, the uh, Hamilton cast a huge shadow over Vandenberg's life, I think a huge inspiration uh, over his life. And uh, the, the tremendous irony, of course, is that as Vandenberg traced the trail of a tradition talking about Hamilton's advocacy of American neutrality and resisting entanglement in permanent alliances, it was Arthur Vandenberg, and this is a time cover from 1945 when the United Nations was organized in San Francisco. Arthur Vandenberg at San Francisco, a Bill of Rights for the World, that here was the fellow raised, growing up worshiping Hamilton, who ended up 
leading a large segment of American public opinion and working closely with the Truman administration, making possible the creation of the United Nations and America's involvement and leadership in it. So uh, a lot of twists and turns in the Hamilton story and in Vandenberg's worship of him. Um, I didn't know we had Ralph's connection of childhood acquaintance but we have Vandenberg's connection of uh, lifelong admiration and uh, uh, drawing on him for inspiration. So thank you very much. Yeah, if anybody has any thoughts or questions, I'd love to see. Yes, Ken. What precipitated the duel that ultimately led to Hamilton's death? You know, I, I was just uh, reading that in the Ron Chernow book. For those of you who've read it, it's Fascinating, fascinating series. He and he and Aaron Burr had been political adversaries for years in in New York politics, and um, and of course he had famously sided with Jefferson with the Jeffersonians. And uh, Gleaves, you can correct me or amplify on this when um, when the Electoral College was was it tied between. Jefferson and Burr, and this was when the parties were still in the early days of formation, and the, the number two in the Electoral College was likely to be the vice president. Uh, Hamilton swung votes to the support of Jefferson so that Jefferson was chosen president, and Burr then became vice president. So Burr always blamed Hamilton as um, sabotaging his political <laughs> career, and Hamilton never trusted Burr. They were, in many respects, they were rivals for power in the um, Federalist Party in New York State. And New York was really pivotal between the, the, the New England states and the southern states. New York had, um, had the, the population and the, the sort of ideology where whichever way it went, it could influence how the country would stand. So uh, Hamilton supported his arch enemy, Jefferson. I mean, Jefferson and Hamilton were huge foes of each other. They were, their, their, their minions wrote the most scurrilous political propaganda about each other. You could imagine, they just savaged each other. And yet, when push came to shove, <laughs> Hamilton said, you know, I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I can't stand what Jefferson stands for, but I'd rather vote for someone whose principles I disagree with than someone who doesn't have any principles. And that's how he looked at Burr. And so, um, so then, but, but even then, that was, that was political hostility. And then the, the sequence of events in, in, was it 1804, is really bizarre when um, there, were, there, were, there was a dinner party in Albany where, um, among some Federalist leaders, where Hamilton was being very critical of Burr. And because Burr had been, after he, um, failed to win the presidency. He was trying to win the governorship of New York. And, the, and Hamilton just said, you know, I can't stand this guy. I know things about him that make me not trust him. And word leaked out to the press. Somebody, one of, one of Hamilton's friends said something about Burr that, you know, Mr. Hamilton was, was critical of him and, and, you know, has even worse things that he could say about him than, than what's been reported. And then uh, another of Hamilton's friends or somebody denied that that had been said. And then somebody else published a fuller account of it to say, oh, yes, we heard him say all kinds of awful things about Burr. And then Burr demanded to know what was Hamilton saying about me. And Burr and Hamilton started exchanging letters. And Hamilton's, Hamilton, instead of saying, hey, I didn't mean anything by it, you know, this is just you know, political stuff, um, Hamilton said, well, what did you hear? If you can prove it, you know, maybe I'll apologize, but I'm not going to just apologize to you for, for something, you know, rumors that I said something bad to you. And the, the tone of these letters keeps elevating, and Burr finally says, well, if I can't get any satisfaction from you any other way, we have to, do, we have to uh, settle this honorably between gentlemen which was, in effect, a call for a duel. And, the, and again, um, there are other people in this room who know more about it than I am, but there's, but there's generally, there, there, Hamilton's friends swear that he, in the, in the code of dueling, 
was going to fire his first shot in the air, was not going to fire at Burr. And uh, there was no such presumption on Burr's part. And so when they met, um, they, they, they're, they're facing off on, this, uh, on this, this sort of rocky ledge below a bluff on the, on the New Jersey side of the river in New Jersey because uh, dueling was, was outlawed in New York and they would have been subject to criminal prosecution. But in, in New Jersey, uh, the law was not as strictly enforced. Uh, so they rode across the, the Hudson to do that. Um, Burr, they, they, they are ready for their first shots and um, as Hamilton is about to fire and his pistol does discharge, uh, Burr fires at the same time and kills him. And um, Hamilton dies a few hours later. They, they row him back across the river, but he, he dies in lower Manhattan at a friend's house uh, like the next day, I think it was. But it was, ultimately it went from a very nasty history of political confrontation to kind of pettiness that got out of hand. And the, they both were adhering to this sort of dueling code that was on its way out. Hamilton's son had been killed in a duel and Hamilton, Hamilton himself didn't believe in dueling. And yet he had, they had this big ego that wasn't just going to apologize for no good reason for something Aaron Burr thought somebody might have said. And so he boxed himself into a corner and then went out and got shot. Yeah, Chuck. Um, did Vandenberg ever write about the duels? Um, no, he didn't. I mean, he, he wrote about, you know, that Aaron Burr was a gangster and, of course, no good and, and uh, no. Did you pass judgment on, on Hamilton? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. I think he probably accepted the the dueling code of honor as something people did in that day, but I, I didn't catch anything further on that. Yes? Are any of the, uh, any of the Bird Street books available in the local libraries, do you know? I don't think they're in the library. I've got copies of them here. You occasionally find them in uh, used bookstores and uh, in, uh, probably, maybe, I don't know if you can find them through Amazon or not, but, um, I've only got one with the cover on, but this is the, the trail of a tradition, and, and these are the other two with this. He's got this same A. Hamilton signature on the front. And then this is actually, like I said, I brought props to, instead of preparedness here. Um, this, is, this is Vandenberg's typescript for that book, Trail of a Tradition. So this would have been um, property of A.H. Vandenberg, the Herald, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So. Uh, along with writing editorials, he was typing up, typing up his manuscript. How, how well do those books sell? Um, you know, I tried, I tried to find that out from Putnam, and they didn't have any records still. They've been folded into a couple of other publishing conglomerates, and they couldn't find any records. So I don't know. No, I, I'd be very curious to find that out. Never found any royalty checks or anything in Vandenberg's, uh, Vandenberg's papers. Well, gosh, thank you all very much for coming today. Very thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Meg. It did not disappoint, it never does, uh, to, to hear you talk about Vandenberg. This was a fitting capstone to what was a very successful series, I, arguably the most successful series we've had at the Hallenstein Center. I thank you for such a, a wonderful way of, of relating uh, Vandenberg to the founders and to us. Uh, really, it was a great bridge presentation. Well, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Really, uh, always a pleasure to host you, and I hope that you will avail yourself of some of the literature in the back there, and please come to more Hauenstein Center events, and uh, you get to hang meet people like Hank, and you yeah. do. Thanks so much.